It was the day before his 52nd birthday. And Abraham Lincoln was boarding a train to leave Springfield, Illinois to become president of the United States. If you remember history, threat of war was looming between Americans against Americans. As he stood there at that train and prepared to leave, he said goodbye to his friends and neighbors uh, who had come to wish their friend off and see their friend off. And here's what Lincoln shared with them. He says, I now leave, not knowing when or whether even I may return. With a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of the divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care commending you, as I hope in your prayers, you will commend me. I bid you an affectionate farewell. You know the way Lincoln ends his life. At an assassin's hand. But the thing that carried Lincoln through the battles, the loss of life, the, the, the pain that he felt as the country fought itself, the thing that carried him was his trust in God. So it's interesting, look at this. He's saying goodbye to friends and family, he's saying goodbye to people that are close to him, and he's saying, there's one thing that I trust right now. He says, look, I'm in this endeavor, and it's worse than what George Washington dealt with, and the same God that carried George Washington through, I trust him to carry me and us through this time, whatever that means. It'll be great and terrible loss of life, brother against brother, state against state, a nation in civil war, even Christian against Christian. One group of people who would say slavery is wrong and another group of people who would say, but this is a God-given thing to us. And, and you had Christian against Christian fighting for freedom for people. It was really a terrible time. Our country is faced with some fear right now, isn't it? If you holler Ebola on a bus, watch out. And as we look at the times that we're in, there are many who would say, wow, Everything's there, all the details are, are, are there, and uh, Jesus is coming really fast. And say that knowing that that means that there's uh, this battle ahead. It's a battle that will take place in the valley, valley of Megiddo. It's a valley and in a battle that will involve the nations of the world coming, and he ultimately, eventually, the world will end. And in the meantime, while this battle is going on and as this, this, this time is increasing, we're, we're going to see one called the Antichrist who will stand against Christians and Christ. And as he does that, we'll see the loss of life. Incidentally, we're seeing that, aren't we? We probably don't get all the stories and hear of all the countries but from Voice of the Martyrs, which is a ministry that tries to encourage and send uh, 
special packets of care, blankets and shirts and things like that, soap and all, and tries to minister to the people that are being literally martyred, they say that we have more people being martyred today for Jesus Christ than have been martyred in all of history. Now, does, does that number, the, how mind-boggling, how big that number must be, does that, does that hit home? See, the, the challenge is because it's so, such numbers and it's in other places and all, and we don't know the person who's just been killed, we can kind of like, oh, yeah, that's bad, but, but it doesn't quite strike us as maybe it needs to. And yet, uh, aren't we watching as we grow in a sense of concern, or should I use the word, real word fear? How many of you like to watch as you hear the reports? And it's, I'd almost wish that they just, you know, stop reporting it. Stop giving ISIS more, more of a position of recognition. But see, as, as that's happening, there's a growing fear. And I'm sure that evil doesn't mind if we get afraid of evil. I'm sure the Antichrist doesn't mind if we get afraid of him. Because maybe then we'll back down. When in point of fact, more than any other time in human history perhaps, because it is today, maybe the best reason, we need to trust in the Lord. Amen. Not depend on our own understanding. In all our ways, submit to Him. And He promises to direct our paths, to make our, our way straight. He promises to guide us through that whole journey. We're in a series, and for those of you who are guests with us, this series is about why pray. Why do we pray? It's because we're whiners, right? And so we just need to whine to God, right? Complain to Him. You know, nobody else is listening to us anymore. So we, you know, God, no, no, no. No, no, it's much more than that. Why do we pray? Because God wants to have a personal, intimate, caring relationship with us. Because he wants to sit down beside us, sometimes hold our hand, sometimes put his arm around us, sometimes pat us on the back. He probably sometimes needs to do the little kick too. But, but he wants to have a more intimate relationship with us. Why? Because he loves us. Because he cares about us. Junior um, has a little boy and Naomi, they have a little boy named Jojo, or Joseph. Yeah. And it's kind of fun to grab Joseph and throw him up in the air. <laughs> but I need to warn you that when you do that, there's a little girl named Bella, Isabella, who will say, me too. <laughs> However, I don't think that they will do that any longer if the next time I throw Joseph or Isabella up, I don't catch them. <laughs> yeah. What is trust? Trust is Joseph, Jojo saying, me too, me too, and giggling and laughing as you throw him up in the air and he's just, yay, okay? And more and more as you grab him and you throw him again, more and more, right? That's trust. And that's what the, the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, is trying to say to us. Trust in the Lord. How? With all your heart. <clears throat> See, the reason why we pray, why we talk to God, is because we trust Him. We pray, I hope anyways, because you believe that He's going to respond. You believe that he's going to answer. You believe that he cares about you. You trust him to listen, right? If you don't think he's going to listen, are you really going to talk to him? But it's because we, we pray because we trust God. We have confidence. We feel safe in his arms, and he makes us feel secure. We, we can actually confide in him because he doesn't go tell our neighbor. Little crest line habit there. We, we trust and because of that, we are able to cast our anxieties on him because he cares about us. 
We trust God to meet our daily needs. We trust him to take care of us every single day and to, to, to do what we need. We trust him because he knows what's best. Although there's a lot of times we think we're going to explain the better way to him. We trust God because he has a view of life and the world and the spirit world that we don't have. And so we pray because we trust God. I'll come back to this, but, but there's a phrase that Jesus used when he was teaching on prayer to his disciples. It's an interesting little one, right? He says, give us this day our daily bread. You see, remember when the children of Israel were out, on, out in the desert? God was feeding them, right? And every day he gave them manna. I know they complained about it because they got tired of it. It was sweet bread and they wanted salty or who knows why. Anyways, they got, it got kind of boring for them. And he gave them quail as well so they had meat too, but they complained about that as well. You know, some people are just complainers, you know what? And, and so, but he says, look, give us this day our daily bread. And God was doing that for them. In fact, however, he said, you just take what you need for one day until you get to the day before the Sabbath. And on the day before the Sabbath, God, I don't want you working on the Sabbath. I want you just to enjoy me. I want this to be a time of us together. He says, then on that day, you collect enough for two days. However, on the other days, all you need is enough for one day. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. And if they t collected more, guess what happened to it? Oh, it turned really bad. By the way, do any of you, have any of you had moldy stuff in your refrigerator? Yeah? You've been collecting too much manna. Okay? <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. Well, like I said, we're going to come back to that. So Psalm 27.3 says, Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. David is saying, here he is, he's the king, right? He's got all kinds of power, but he's saying, look, even when war comes, I'm going to be confident. I'm going to trust that God's with me, that God's going to help me. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are what? Steadfast, because they trust in you. How's your anxiety level? You may want to test it because your anxiety level is saying something about your ability at trust. The anxiety is actually coming because you're, you're afraid and you're saying, I don't know that I can trust the situation or the people around me or whatever. And, and even we can go into major anxiety attacks, can't we? And at the core of that is the sense of fear of something. And, we, and, and, and look, God's saying, 1 Peter 5 incidentally, Cast your anxieties on me because I, I what? I care about you. I love that passage because it's a passage, it's a great spiritual warfare passage. It continues to go on and says, watch out, the devil's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And he makes this noise so we run and die and get in trouble and all like that. Anxiety wants to take over. But I really love the passage. Because a couple of things, it says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand that in due time he may lift you up. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares about you. And the, and the, the other piece of the passage is, it says, and, and here, you don't just do this once. Here's my anxiety. Carol, please take my anxiety. Wow, that was, she was really willing to take it. <laughs> Take, my, take your anxiety. And we give it to God, right? No, excuse me, I'm getting afraid again. Thank you. I need it back here. Like a, take, take my anxiety again. Okay. But I'm getting afraid again. So, oh, but, but I need it back. I'm getting really scared. I need my anxiety. I don't hold on. See, we're doing the same thing with God, aren't we? And the, the neat thing about that text, it says cast and keep on casting. Because some of us, when we get really nervous, we can't just give it up. And so we've got to give it. And we give it, and we give it, and we give it, and we have to keep on doing that. That's why Paul says to pray without ceasing. That's why he says that, that if you continue to take your requests to God with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, he will give you peace that goes beyond understanding. We need to trust in the Lord with all our hearts. 
We also need to pray for understanding of the times, folks. And I understand there are a lot of speakers out there that are giving us all the information. You can listen to all kinds of commentators and find out all kinds of things about what's going on in any part of the world, right? We're in a great political conversation right now, yes? Democrats and Republicans are talking about their various positions and what's the right one. What always is troubling is that there's Christians on both sides of those positions. Have you ever noticed that? And we're, do, is, are we in the end times? Well, the fact is we've been in the end times since Jesus ascended into heaven. So really, it's an easy answer. Are we in the end times? Yes. But are we in the end end times? Like, I mean, could it be a year away? Could it be just seven years away? Is it a thousand years away? Because a thousand years, that's not as big a deal as if it's one or seven. So, so which one are we closer to? Well, there's a lot of, let's say, okay, well, how do you understand that? How do you know the times? Well, it would help if you get in the word, right? If you really want to understand the end times, you might want to read Matthew 25. And you might want to read Daniel. You, you might want to read Revelation. You might want to read 1 Thessalonians. So, so it might help to get in the word of God. Or you can just go to listen to, to someone else and get their opinion. Now, I'm just going to warn you that an opinion is a negative pinion. And O, O is for negative. Pinion is for wisdom from God. And O, pinion is negative wisdom from God. A pinion is wisdom from God. Don't we want God's wisdom? Like I say, you can get God's wisdom by getting into the word, or you can get somebody else's opinion. We pray because we want to understand the times. We don't want to lean on our own understanding. And innocently, when the writer of Proverbs is saying this, uh, he's saying, somebody ought to answer that in case it's God. Uh, Understanding is what's happening inside you. It's your inner person. It's the, the inclinations of your soul. He says, the writer of Proverbs is saying, really, don't support yourself with your understanding. Don't depend on your intelligence or your insight. I know uh, you guys are really smart people, but God's saying he's a little more wise than you, has a little bit more wisdom and understanding of things than you, and so therefore trust him instead of your own understanding. Proverbs 28, 26 says, those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. Chuck Smith, in talking about this passage, says that we're in a world situation that is so confusing, people have lost sense of direction. Chuck's with the Lord now in heaven. He says, our... our, Our understanding is so limited based on limited knowledge, which is sometimes faulty. Yeah. First Chronicles 12, 32 says, from Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. God puts people who will try to understand the times and he gives them counsel. In 1 Chronicles 22, 12, it says, May the Lord give you discretion and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. In Daniel 10, 1, and and I'd encourage you to read Daniel again sometime. Daniel 8, 9, 10, all have information about what's going to happen in the end of time. In Daniel 10, 1, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was also known as Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. We pray to God because we want to understand our times, and God promises to reveal that to us. The text goes on in Proverbs and says, in all your ways, submit to him. I think the King James says, in in all your ways, acknowledge him. King James says, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The word there that's interesting, the word for acknowledge, the word that in the NIV is translated submit to him, the word is yada. Some of you have heard that word before, haven't you? It's the word that is used to describe Adam, Yadad Eve, and they had a child. He knew her. 
It's the word that, that Satan used in talking to Eve when he says, oh, if you eat from this tree, you see, God's trying to keep you from your dying what he knows, from knowing what he knows. He's trying to keep you from that. And if you eat from this tree, you're going to know good and evil. You're going to know. You're going to yada what God yadas. Wow, that's really special. You're going to be something. Yada. He says, in all your ways, yada him. In all your ways, get to know God. Yada, it's that same word that the psalmist used in Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you yada me. You yada when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you yada it completely. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I'm coming to yada that full well. Search me, God, and yada my heart. Test me and yada my anxious thoughts. I think this is what Jesus was trying to say when he said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added on to you. And then verse 34 goes on from there and says, therefore, do not worry for about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. So we pray because we can know God and know his thoughts, and he knows us. We also pray for God's help to follow his way. And he will make your paths straight. He will direct your paths. He will guide you. Interesting, the word that's used there is yashar, to make a way straight. It's found in Proverbs 11.5, the righteousness of the blameless makes their paths straight, but the wicked are brought down by their own wickedness. Proverbs 15.21, folly brings joy to one who has no sense, but whoever has understanding, whoever has yashar, whoever recognizes the way, keeps a straight course. And this one, Psalm 5.8, Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Have you ever been confused about direction in your life? What, what, what Lord's trying to tell us is that if you'll come and converse with me, I'll give you direction in your life, and I'll clear things up. It's you know, going around like this. By the way, have you ever uh, rode a boat in the fog? Well, I was reading about a pastor who did this, and he was pretty confident. He was out on a lake that he knew very well, and he had been uh, fishing around the lake, and, and he got to an inlet where some water stream was coming into the lake, and he knew that directly across from this inlet into his little lake, directly across there was his house, directly across. So he decides, okay, cool, this is easy. Takes his boat and points it, towards the other, towards his house, and he simply rose, planning on going straight across in the fog to the other side to get his, to his house. He finally got to the other side, and he noticed the same inlet where he had started. You can be very confident that you're going straight, and that you're going the direction you're supposed to be going, but when you're in the fog, you may not know, and you may find out you come right back in the circle to where you started. The writer, Solomon, is saying to us that if we will trust the Lord, he's going to direct us in the fog to get straight across. It's interesting. What did Jesus say about, the, about a, a, a way? <laughs> Enter through the narrow gate. This is Matthew 7. In fact, I might as well back up. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Then down in verse 13, he says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. 
and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now here's an interesting one. Jesus, in talking with a multitude of people that are following him and getting all excited about him, so he he has to kind of, um, I don't know, filter them a little bit. And so he makes some interesting statements in John 6. He says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Verse 35 says, then Jesus declared, and this is his response to them. Here's what he answers. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He goes on, verse 53, and says, Very truly I tell you, unless, watch out, this could gross you out, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. It's one of the reasons why Christians got accused of being what? Cannibals. Yeah, because they talked about it. Every time they got together, they were eating and drinking blood and eating the body and like... You know, I know it was communion, but the, the people on the outside didn't recognize that. They didn't know. It. They just hear, you know, we're going to drink blood today. Ah, that's gross. We're going to eat the flesh. Ooh, yucko. No, no, I won't go there. I just... <laughs> Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, but yet unless you eat the, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. What's Jesus saying? Well, he said it in another way, and he used a similar word. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also if you want to go there. When asked about that, (laughs) we don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. He responds, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but through me. He's been describing this narrow way, and, he says, and, and what the pro- writer of Proverbs is saying, Solomon's telling us, look, if you will trust God, he's going to show you that narrow way. He's going to show you that path to follow, and whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, he's going to help you with that if you'll trust him. He'll direct that path for you. He'll take the confusing stuff out of the way. He'll remove the obstacles. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I didn't say it's going to be flat. I didn't say you're going to just float along it. But he's going to guide you in that very simple way, if you will trust in him. So the question of the morning is a very simple question. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? It's interesting. There's been this great conversation, sometimes hostility, about what's on our money? In God we trust. Really. As a nation, would you say we trust God? As a state, do we trust God? San Bernardino County, do we trust God? Crestline, do we trust God? But see, trust begins where? Trust isn't about out there. The trust is, do you trust God? Do you trust God with the questions? Do you trust God with your sin? Or are you like most people in the Bible, they try to hide it? Do you trust God with your future? Because what Jesus said, if you're sitting there worrying about it, you're probably not trusting. If you're holding on to that anxiety, and and I apologize, some people have clinical anxiety, I understand that. Sometimes there's chemical causes to anxiety, understand that as well, but be careful. Don't Don't allow that to be too much of an excuse because there's still a piece of it in which God's trying to say, trust me, not the stuff. So do you trust God? If so, are you willing to let him toss you up in the air 
and catch you.